All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, if you're here, we're studying the late 1800s in America. And this video today is on organized labor. So we're going to look at the labor movement that happened in America in the late 1800s. And one key you're looking at right here is, uh, this is Uncle Sam, by the way, with a little goatee, and a little striped pants, overcoat. What's he saying to the workers? Go back to work. And if you look at it, he's saying it in a bunch of different languages, speaking to the immigrant population. All right. So that's kind of Uncle Sam's viewpoint on what is happening with labor. If they go on strike, what's he telling them? Go back to work. So let's just get a peek for uh, why organized labor took place, why uh, different groups got together and says, hey, we need to create labor unions. Uh, and it's going to obviously deal with uh, the working conditions. So let's get it going here. Uh, what are the reasons for the growth of organized labor? Well, business grew in the late 1800s, as we've already looked at, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, corporations. And generally, you know, workers were, were making more money, but there was still periodic unemployment. Uh, there were huge, terrible, poor working conditions that existed in factories in terms of the hours that people were working and the, the safety in the workplace was an issue. So uh, employers, we know, excuse me, had enormous power over the lives of their workers and their day-to-day -day lives, right? So they offered, uh, they often lowered wages and fired workers at will, depending on, uh, you know, certain layoffs and what happened. But this was a, a big problem. There was no minimum wage back then. So you're working for a company for a certain amount of years, all of a sudden they just decide they're going to lower wages. Well, now you're making less money. So that's, that's a problem. Well, what grew that? Uh, workers needed a voice of their own, so they developed labor unions. So American workers formed a different labor unions to improve their working conditions. Popular slogan for these early labor unions was eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours for what we will. That will be the slogan of the, the Knights of Labor, one of the first major labor unions, all right? Workers also use something known as collective bargaining. And how that would work is union members would represent the entire workforce. So instead of, you know, 2,000 workers storming into the boss's office, they would elect some some high uh, members of their, their group, and they would consider them to be union members, and then those members would negotiate for everybody. So instead of each worker asking for benefits for themselves, all the workers would pressure the employer to do something for everyone. So that's the idea of collective bargaining. You're bargaining as a unit. You're bargaining as a group. All right. Nice little flag. <laughs> Excuse me. From the Knights of Labor, you got eight hours for labor, eight hours for recreation, and eight hours to sleep. Notice the spelling of labor there. Kind of a, an English way of spelling that. <clears throat> if you need uh, the vocabulary, you can stop on the fly and check out those very clear over there. Sites. So there's collective bargaining. All right. I don't know why I got that twice, but uh, the Knights of Labor will be the first major labor union. So as we begin to discuss the Knights, you see that it's formed around 1869, and the leader at that time was Terence Powderly. The Knights of Labor was a huge labor union, which really welcomed any skilled, unskilled laborers. They welcomed women, African Americans, children. They basically took on everybody. And one of their, uh, basically what they, they fought for, you have the eight-hour workday, which leads to their slogan. So eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, eight hours for me. They also work to end child labor, and they, work, they push for equal opportunities for women as well. All right. Uh, the membership actually declines in the late 1890s, and that is due to unsuccessful strikes and the emergence of a new labor union that's going to be much, much stronger, and that is the American Federation of Labor. So just kind of keep in mind the first major labor union is the Knights of Labor, largely unsuccessful, and they took on everybody. Right, skilled and unskilled workers. Right, there's Terrence Powderly, by the way, the nice little stash. Gotta love him, right? Knights of Labor, uh, you know, you see them striking, and you, you know, see what's going on here. Nice little picture, but I want to get to the good one. All right, the American Federation of Labor. This is the one you should really focus on. That is the AFL, not a football conference. This is a labor union, all right? Founded by Sam Gompers years later, years after the Knights of Labor. So we're looking at 1886. It united. Only skilled craftsmen, so skilled laborers only. I can't tell you how important that is. It did not accept unskilled laborers. It did not accept, uh, accept uh, women and everything. It was white men, skilled only. 
Uh, it's known as a bread and butter union. And what are bread and butter issues? Those are better wages. They want to make more money. They want to work less hours. And they're, they're searching for better working conditions. Okay. And you have to know this, right? Groups such as women, immigrants, African Americans, unskilled laborers certainly could not join there. It was only white skilled craftsmen only. It was called a crafts union. Uh, there is Sam Gompers. Later in life, he'll have a mustache and he'll smoke a ton of cigars. All right. Now, later on, the American Federation of Labor, as you see here, the AFL, merges with the industrial unions. And today, there's still a labor organization known as the AFL-CIO, AFL-CIO, still a very strong labor union today. Well, as uh, certain groups of people saw <laughs> the crafts men get together in their union. The ladies are like, hey, let, let's let's do one for ourselves. Most women at that time worked in the textile industry, creating fabrics, creating uh, clothing. So the international lady, ladies garment, garments are, are types of shirts, workers union. So ILGWU, International Ladies Garment Workers Union, developed. So it's formed to unite the women who are working in sweatshops and textile factories, right? They eventually, because of their craft, will join with the AFL after a successful strike in 1910. Notice in 1886, when the AFL was out, those women weren't allowed, right? March 25th, 1911, uh, there is a horrible fire at the Tri Triangle Sherways factory in New York City. Uh, I believe the numbers are 146, but you know, 150 women died in this factory. And they pushed for better conditions in factories. And actually, that event, that single event, galvanized the country and said, hey, it's time to fix the uh, conditions that people are working in. So it led to incredible positive changes for female workers in factories. There's tons of laws that the government pumps out after this event and say, we're going to make these factories safer. All right. Um, and this is the, the procession. So after 150 young girls die in this factory in New York City on a rainy day, thousands showed up for this funeral procession. And they say, hey, it's time. We're going to mourn our loss, but it's time for you to fix the problems in factories. And our government actually does. So they do listen. All right. That is a scene outside that 1911 uh, event in March where that, those are young girls who jumped from a ninth, 10th floor window. And uh, obviously they jumped to their death because the, wind, uh, the building was on fire okay uh, these are young garment workers ladies workers representing this labor union and uh, this is in Yiddish and, and this one's in America where they say they're basically treated like slaves in these factories and they want the government to fix it and uh, in the, the early 1900s the government actually does so there's their slogan the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and they join with the AFL CIO all right now there's going to be much conflict between labor and management the owners of these factories want workers to just work and do what they need to do and pay them less money. Well, the workers, on the other hand, they want better conditions and they want to make more money. So you have this, this conflict that erupts, all right? And uh, the labor unions, what they're going to do is they're going to boycott certain companies, but their, their biggest modality, how do they hurt the, uh, the factory owners, is go on strike, all right? So if they don't collectively bargain successfully, then they go on strike. Well, the owners really don't like this because then they have to hire other people, find other people, and, um, you know, production might slow down. So owners are going to try to stop unions from doing what they do. So they're going to use things called blacklist and yellow dog contracts to stop the union activity. Today, these are illegal, right? Blacklist is a list circulated by employers, which says what? Uh, you're not going to be hired because we think you're going to organize the workers or you believe in labor unions or you like labor unions. On the flip side of that, yellow dog contracts, you had to sign before you got the job. So uh, before I hired you at my factory, this is going to be a contract between me and you and the employee. That's you. You're going to agree not to join a union, not to talk about a union, not to even discuss union activities when you walk into my factory. So the yellow dog contracts were ways to stop people from even thinking about joining a union. Um, there's gonna, I'm going to take you through four major strikes here. We did these in class. If you need a, kind of a recap on them, here you go. There was a great railway strike of 1877. 
a series of pay cuts, a bunch of railroad workers went on strike. And this went across several states, which kind of shut down the railroad industry. Well, our president, Rutherford B.A.'s, he sent in the federal troops against the strikers. They attacked him, they beat him down, and they basically uh, told him, you got to go back to work. And in this, uh, this great railroad strike across those cities, over 100 strikers actually died. The railroad workers who went on strike did not gain any of their demands. They didn't get more money. They didn't get a shorter work day. They got a kick in the butt from the government, and the government told them to go back to work. So the business owners were looking good here. So they were able, because they had the backing of the government, to take a hard position against those unions to really push back. Right? Uh, and obviously this is the Great Railroad Strike, a little plaque, kind of dictating when it happened in 1877. So you can see that down in Maryland if you want to check that out. The other big one really goes down in Chicago, and this is known as the Haymarket Riot of 1886. The riot isn't sponsored by the, the Knights of Labor, uh, but a general labor protest is sponsored by the Knights of Labor. And this this is just a rally, a bunch of people getting together. Sorry, I sneezed. Getting together in Chicago, and in this little, little rally, somebody tosses a bomb. And several people die, including a couple police officers. Now we got some problems, right? So the Knights of Labor who sponsored the protest, they were responsible for throwing the bomb, but they certainly got the blame for throwing the bomb. And public opinion towards that labor union goes way south, and they say, you know what, these, these unions are bad, they're killing police officers. And really what happens is the message gets lost because you have this bomb and you have these policemen are dying. But... Uh, in the end, the workers do not get their eight-hour eight hour workday. They do not get their eight hours of rest. They do not get higher pay. They got absolutely nothing. All right. So fast forward to 1892, and that is the Homestead Steel Strike in Pennsylvania. So where is this happening? It's happening at one of Carnegie Steel plants, which Carnegie's got a ton of money, by the way. There's a huge wage cut, and uh, the workers go on strike. It's pretty simple. Uh, management, the manager, his name was Henry Frick, he brought in a bunch of Pinkerton guards or Pinkerton agents. And these were private security guards that were really good at breaking up strikes. Now, how did the Pinkertons break up strikes? They showed up in their little trench coats, they had their guns on them, and they just beat on these strikers and they even would shoot and kill some of them. Well, if you're a you know, regular Joe who's got a family at home and these two would show up, it's pretty simple. You're probably going to go back to work, all right? Violence followed when these Pinkertons showed up. Sixteen strikers were killed. The National Guard was called in the end, and basically what happened? Fewer than 25% of the strikers got their jobs back, and they didn't get a wage increase. They got to go back with nothing. So this is uh, one of the paintings and pictures here that shows you. Here are the strikers outside the, uh, the steel plant there. These Pinkerton agents showed up on these little barges, and they started shooting, and they started uh, beating them down. And really, once again, it's another strike. And what did the workers get? Absolutely nothing. Right. The final big one is going to be the Pullman strike in 1894. Uh, George Perman made railroad cars, and this basically turned into something larger than just in a small town. It was a national railroad strike. Over 300,000 workers said, we're done working for these railroads. And what did it do? It halted transportation. It shut down the railroad industry. Well, president not so happy with that. Right. So President Grover Cleveland is going to call in the federal troops to end the strike. Give those strikers a big kick in the butt and say, hey, man, get back to work. And what did the workers get? You got it. Absolutely nothing. Right. In 1895, the Supreme Court actually rules in a famous case in Reed Debs because Eugene Debs was the leader of these railroad workers. And it basically said that the president's actions were just. The president can use the troops because those strikers were stopping trade, interstate trade. The federal government, here's what you need to know. Highlight this. Do something on your paper. you got to know this. The federal government really favored the businesses over the people. Right? Take a look at all those strikes, all four that I just mentioned. Who did the federal government back? It backed the business owners, not the people. Right? It's kind of showing you that the railroad and the federal government showing up, kind of taking, taking care of business. Now, fast forward a little bit. You see 1912 here as we get into the 1900s. There is a huge textile strike in 1912. Textiles, once again, are the factories that make the clothes, right? Uh, and there was another labor year. These are kind of like the crazy people, the, the wobblies they were called. They were the industrial workers of the world. 
unlike the AFL, the AFL was made up of mainly skilled laborers. The IWW is made up of a whole bunch of unskilled laborers just kind of all banded together. So they're a radical union of skilled and unskilled laborers. And there was a huge strike against textile mills up in Lawrence, Massachusetts. There was a ton of textile industry up in the, the New England area, right? The strike was actually successful for the workers. But once again, look at the time here. This strike would not have been successful in the late 1800s. It will be successful in the early 1900s. Why? Because the federal government began to help the employees and not the employers. The federal government finally said, yo, these people need a raise. And it poor pressure, put pressure on the factory owners to do just that. Right? Lawrence strike likely to be spread. They say it was getting larger. Government steps in and says, yo, give these people what they need. Right? So as we look at the entire era of strikes in the late 1800s, there was a huge gap between rich and poor. And it's going to get larger. What's that gap? The rich people were getting richer and their poor people just weren't making enough. Right? Well, there was tensions between who? The workers and the owners. Because the owners were the rich and the workers were the poor. Right? What did workers do? They organized. They created labor unions. Business leaders didn't like that because some of these labor unions began to, to gain power. There's momentum there, right? Uh, there was an era of large and violent strikes that began with the railroad strike of 1877. Major strikes included the Great Railway, the Homestead, and the Pullman, and you can even add in there the Haymarket Square bombing, right? Well, the government at that time Late 1800s, sided with business leaders, sometimes using the army to put down the strikes. So in the late 1800s, the workers didn't get anything. They will in the early 1900s. So I encourage you to, you know, once again, study those four major strikes. Uh, review this information. you got to know the AFL is down with skilled laborers only. And um, keep, keep uh, posted because there will be, uh, be more videos coming. Have a great one. Bye.